My name is James Wykowski, and I'm one of the inpatient chief residents here at the University of Washington Medical Center. We're really excited to welcome back Dr. Sharisha Danaretti to Grand Rounds this year. Uh, as many of you know, Dr. Danaretti is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Um, her research interests really are focused on the intersection of people with substance use disorders and other barriers to care and in infectious diseases, including HIV. Um, clinically, she is the medical director of the Harborview Infectious Disease Clinic, um, as well as being one of the co-founders of the SHE Clinic. Um, and most recently, she has focused her efforts to help guide first our vaccine response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and now the UW monkeypox outbreak response. Uh, and so when we plan this Grand Rounds, I joke that this is hopefully the last time we have Dr. Dan already back for Grand Rounds to talk about the newest infection um, challenging our system. And yet I am also reassured as we hear about news that if something new comes our way next year, we'll have Dr. Dan already here to help guide us through it. Um, as a reminder, since this is our first Grand Rounds, folks are welcome to put their questions in the chat um, and I'll be moderating those and we'll do some Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, thanks so much everyone for being here and I'll hand it off to Dr. Dan, hand it off to Dr. Dan already. Thank you so much, James, for the introduction, and thank you for having me for Grand Rounds. Um, as James mentioned, I'll be talking about the monkey box outbreak of 2022, um, learning goals and objectives, just to describe the current monkeypox epidemic, review some clinical manifestations of monkeypox, and then management and prevention. Of course, we've been really focused on one big infection for the last over two and a half years now. That's really dominated our work, uh, inpatient, outpatient, and has really been the focus of our in, uh, prevention efforts with vaccination. But we know that this is not the only thing, and inevitably other pandemics, epidemics are on their way. Monkeypox is one of them, but we've also heard about polio uh, in New York in particular, and then, of course, increasing reports of tomato flu. So I wanted to frame this talk by using a case of the first patient I saw here back in May um, of this year, who is a gentleman who presented to an outside clinic with penile lesions. He had visited a friend in London in early May and had uh, anal and sort of intercourse with this friend and had spent the night with him for several nights in his room and shared a bed. He returned to the U.S. in mid-May and had noticed that he had had penile lesions, not painful initially, but then subsequently did become painful. He went to his urgent care affiliated with his primary care doctor and was diagnosed with herpes. He was swabbed also at that time and treated empirically. Um, the testing came back negative. And so he didn't have any improvement and he continued to have new lesions in that area. So he went to another clinic. And he actually astutely said, hey, I was just in the UK and I've been listening to news reports about this thing called monkeypox. Is that something I could have? And so the provider there coordinated testing with public health and it came back positive. These were the lesions that were on his penis. Initially, they had developed uh, as three or four discrete lesions that then coalesced and then a couple of adjacent lesions as well. By the time he was referred to me at the Harborview Infectious Disease Clinic, he actually had additional lesions that had developed since the PCR result had come back positive. Within days of the PCR result coming back positive, he had an oral lesion. And, it, and this is on his ankle, but he actually had numerous lesions all over his body. So I wanted to step back and say, well, what is monkeypox? How long has it been around? What, what causes it? So we'll go through some of these things. Uh, monkeypox, unlike SARS-CoV-2, which was res relatively new, we knew about it. We um, It was discovered in 2019 um, and then noted to have clinical infection in humans. Monkeypox, however, has been around for decades. It was first discovered in 1958 and it was isolated in monkeys, which is why it got its na unfortunate name now. Um, in monkeys that were shipped from Singapore to Denmark. A little over a decade later, the first human case was reported in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
there was probably some transmission going on, but the first um, from that time, um, sporadic transmission, but the first uh, reports of sustained human trans human to human transmission were actually in 2003. And that was also in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Around that time was the first US outbreak. And that was actually um, directly associated with animals that had been transported, um, prairie dogs, which were a, a hot commodity that people wanted, look how cute they are, but they um, were importing them for selling as pets. And they were co-transported with um, giant Gambian rats that actually were infected with monkeypox. And so there were cases of uh, prairie dog to human transmission of monkeypox at that time, and there were 53 cases. Since that time, we really haven't seen much monkeypox. And until 2017, there were case reports going on in, in Nigeria. There were spattering of cases, sporadic episodes, but there was a larger outbreak in 2017 of 183 cases across 18 states. Um, in Nigeria, and it was thought to reflect maybe a declining smallpox immunity, as well as increased interaction with animals that were um, hosting the disease. And then five years later, here we are uh, with our global current global outbreak in 2022. Between 2017 and uh, 2022, there were some sporadic cases, particularly in the UK, there were seven documented cases between 2018 and 2021, but thought to be directly imported from areas where there was known uh, monkeypox in humans. The current global outbreak is very different in that all of those countries in red had not been traditionally known to have monkeypox or known human to human transmission of monkeypox. So the spread is quite significant compared to what we had seen even um, a few years before. Oh, here we go. Um, so here we are currently, as of yesterday, when I pulled this graph, um, of where we are worldwide, over 50,000 cases of monkeypox, and the majority of them in countries that have traditionally not had monkeypox cases. Fortunately, the mortality rate is quite low. As of yesterday, there are only 15 reported deaths uh, from this monkeypox outbreak out of the over 50,000 cases that we've seen. And you can see that the, the uh, diameter of the circle is um, proportional to the number of cases, and you can see the U.S. has quite a number of cases. As of yesterday, uh, CDC is reporting close to 20,000 cases of confirmed monkeypox in the United States, and the darker the blue, the more cases there are being reported. There's thought to be some under-reporting as well. In Washington State, we have about 350 cases the majority of those cases are centered in King County. And you can see here um, from the first cases being reported at mid-May to now um, that we have uh, a considerable number of cases, particularly in July and early August, and we're still getting numbers of reports in. So this lower graph doesn't necessarily reflect a decline in cases just yet. So one thing important to note is that there are two different clades. Um, clade one is the one that was originally uh, reported, and these are this is new nomenclature as of this year. There were um, uh, there were they were court categorizing as as three clades before, but now there's two clades with a subclade. And why that's important is that clade one has um, traditionally the one that had been focused on Congo Basin and Central Africa, Central Africa is associated with a higher mortality, up to 10% mortality. The clade two, particularly the clade two B that we're seeing in, in this outbreak is actually associated with a far lower mortality, as I mentioned, 15 deaths out of you know, many more cases that we're seeing, over 50,000 cases that we're seeing. So what is monkeypox? It is an orthopox virus, same genus as variola or smallpox and vaccinia, which is used in the smallpox vaccine. 
there are a large number of viruses that are in this and they're variable in pathogenicity and hosts who hosts this virus. It's a double-stranded DNA virus. The transmission is thought to be, uh, it's a zoonotic disease. There are rodents that are thought to be the natural reservoir. There is animal to human transmission as we've seen in the 2003 outbreak. And then I'll bring up another case report of um, human to animal transmission as well. There, uh, it's from contact with bodily fluids and mucosal lesions. And human to human transmission can be direct from infected lesions or fluid. And that can be spread through intimate contact. Here in this very heteronormative figure that you see, um, it can be um, spread through close contact skin lesions sexually. It, it is also considered a sexually transmitted disease in that sense, um, given a shared body fluids and close intimate contact. It can also um, be spread through contaminated materials such as bedding and clothing. So sharing those things with an individual who is infected with monkeypox is a risk factor. And then in utero, um, uh, transmission is also um, been reported and rarely or less commonly via respiratory droplets, but it is something that is of concern because it has been identified in um, nasal pharyngeal swabs uh, as a monkey pox PCR has been positive in individuals. And so the question of whether it can be active shedding as a transmission that way. Although the majority of cases have been in men who have sex with men in this current global outbreak, um, there have been some cases in women. And we uh, know of two cases actually that have been cared for within UW Medicine in cis women um, in, uh, in Seattle area. One was actually a case that Maria Corcoran uh, diagnosed at She Clinic, um, a woman who is um, a patient there who likely engages in sex work. And then another woman without clear transmission risk factor or tr risk factors that Maggie Green took care of at Northwest Clinic. And then we've all probably seen the reports in the Seattle Times of a child, an infant at um, Children's Hospital, um, thought to be from spread from the parent. And then there in the Lancet, there is also um, a, a report of human to dog transmission of monkeypox virus as well. And Peter Rabinowitz, who is one of our uh, colleagues here at UW Medicine, he is doing a study with pets um, uh, who have human, uh, who have um, owners that have monkeypox. So what happens with monkeypox in terms of what happens after exposure in terms of symptoms. So after exposure, there is an incubation period and that incubation period can be quite long, actually up to three weeks before you can have some symptoms. So if someone's been exposed to monkeypox, we uh, are asking that they uh, isolate and they quarantine for three weeks because they could have symptoms, particularly if they have a close contact. But the median is about eight and a half days. There can be a prodrome, but not everyone has a prodrome, um, and particularly in this um, current outbreak. And that prodrome can be fevers, headaches, really nonspecific viral sy symptoms that are indistinguishable from COVID potentially, um, lymphadenopathy, myalgias, fatigue, and that can last up to five days. The rash, like I mentioned, can start without the prodrome. And then the rash can develop, and it usually is within one to four days of the prodrome. They begin as macules that develop into papules, then pustules. Proctitis has been one of the more commonly seen symptoms uh, in this current outbreak. And the rash can take quite some time to resolve, two to four weeks. And when we talk about resolution, we talk about the, the lesion scabbing over and then the scab falling off to reveal um, healed skin because the scab can still be infectious. Here is the progression of the lesions. Um, so initially a macule, so it's pretty nonspecific. You may not really think about monkeypox at that time. And then you can get a papule and then the more characteristic vesicles that are seen and then the pustules and then what happens is that you get that SR, that crusting over it, and then that crusting heals. 
This is from the Lancet earlier this year um, Look that showed some different clinical manifestations um, of the disease. There's some subungual one here in the lower left-hand corner. And then um, the uh, ultrasound is actually showing an abscess. And we have seen patients with uh, presenting with abscesses and even one with septic arthritis that came in to Harborview to get admitted. So there are some unusual presentations that we're seeing not just classic um, cutaneous lesions. Here's uh, from the more recent New England Journal paper um, from the UK experience showing the oral lesions. And you can see here um, that vary in uh, number and location here. And similar to the patient I showed you that I saw in July, these um, tongue lesions that can look not exactly pox type, type lesions. And you can see in the oral pharynx that they don't have necessarily a pox like appearance. And one thing that's important to note in these lesions is that sometimes patients don't have numerous lesions. In fact, the majority of patients typically have less than 10 lesions. And so patients may not even note that the lesion at first, particularly in the oral pharynx. However, they can have a very sore throat or pharyngitis type symptoms as their presentation. And then um, perianal, anal, and rectal um, lesions, like I mentioned, this, is an, uh, this seems to be a more common location, particularly in uh, gay bisexual MSM who have had this infection that you can see um, these lesions that can be internal and they can present with significant proctitis or pain uh, and pain in that area that can be misidentified as potentially gonorrhea or chlamydia um, that is actually monkeypox itself. And you can see the wide range of lesions that you can see here um, in the perianal area. Not everyone may have symptoms though. And these, there are two recent studies that were just published last in the last couple of weeks. One from Belgium, which actually, and, and they're both very similar, the Belgian and French studies. The first one was a, a, a Belgian study that looked at 224 samples that done at a sexual health clinic. They went back and looked at people who are tested for gonorrhea and chlamydia and actually ran monkeypox PCRs on those individuals. And four of them actually had monkeypox positive PCR. One in retrospect did have a lesion um, that was consistent with monkeypox, but the other three had no lesions, no symptoms, and didn't develop any symptoms. Um, and so the concern is, are there people that are actually asymptomatically shedding? And what does that mean for transmission of this disease? The French study, which is also very similar, was done at a sexual health clinic in Paris between early June and mid-July of this year. And they um, collected samples from uh, over 700 MSM. Um, 323 of those individuals had no symptoms of monkeypox. And they tested those individuals um, who had had anal swabs done. So just over 200 had anal swabs done for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And they checked them for monkeypox. And 13 or 6.5% of those individuals were monkeypox positive, even though they didn't have any symptoms of monkeypox at that time, or did or they did not even develop symptoms after the fact. So these are relatively new reports, but there had been older reports too, case reports of asymptomatic shedding of monkeypox. We don't know what that means quite exactly for how this epidemic will uh, evolve. The other thing I want to mention is um, mimics. We've uh, in the ID clinic here, we um, are getting lots of questions about, well, could this be acne? Could this be herpes? Could this be something else? Uh, or do I have to worry about monkeypox? And um, as you can see, some of these lesions can look like the monkeypox lesions that I showed you. And so having a low index of suspicion to swab somebody for monkeypox, I think is really important just because we can see these mimics. And also we're seeing um, other STDs at the time of monkeypox diagnosis, like syphilis, like gonorrhea or chlamydia. So having monkeypox on the mind and testing for monkeypox is totally appropriate, even when you're seeing somebody for other STDs that may have a rash that's consistent with monkeypox. 
So how do people do? Well, um, we have some case series that show that people, for the most part, do very well. Um, the case fatality rate, as I mentioned in the, the C1 clade, is quite high, 10%, but much lower in this current outbreak of the C2B clade. Um, there, uh, that being said, people that are more immunosuppressed and children and even pregnant women can have more severe disease. We've had a few cases in people with HIV, um, particularly low CD4 counts, that have been hospitalized with more severe uh, presentations, specifically abscess-like presentations, one with a facial abscess that was underlying a cluster of monkeypox lesions. And we've had individuals who haven't been able to swallow due to severe pharyngitis from their monkeypox lesions as well, who have, have had HIV. We are also seeing some bacterial superinfection. Whether this is truly a bacterial superinfection is hard to know. Many of our patients are getting antibiotics because they have slow healing lesions or what looks like an abscess, uh, cutaneous abscess uh, near the area of monkeypox. Um, we've also found that when they uh, culture or check that abscess, it is PCR positive for monkeypox. So how much of it is just all the monkeypox and inflammation of that tissue itself versus bacterial super infection? It's unclear. Um, permanent skin scarring, I think that's one of the big concerns specifically, um, as we all know from um, its cousin, uh, smallpox, that it can be very disfiguring, the scarring. Uh, including hypopigmentation or hypo, hypo, hyper or hypopigmentation. Um, rarely there's been reports of pneumonia, dehydration, sepsis. And again, with clade 2B, this is not as big as of a concern as with clade 1, uh, which can cause more severe disease. So what about testing? Really, it requires a de the definitive diagnosis requires PCR um, testing, and we are so fortunate that we have um, our, our own in-house UW lab uh, that uh, that does monkeypox PCR, and that's run every Monday through Saturday, and the turnaround time is quite fast, so 24 hours. Usually, if you test someone uh, after 9.30 in the morning on a day, it'll come back by 4.30, 5 o'clock the following day. So it's a very good turnaround time. Initially, it had all been done by the state lab with approval by the state lab, and that had led to some really um, significant delays and also confusion about how to test and how to order the test. Now, the, now that we have UW online, as well as some large commercial labs that are now offering, the access to testing is much better and the turnaround time uh, for at least our lab is quite good, but other labs may have a more of a delay for a few days uh, turnaround time. I think it's really important to know that currently in our system, we can test at pretty much any of our clinics and also our urgent care clinics are ramping up to be able to just offer testing for people who call the contact center concerned about monkeypox, even if they're not established patients here to decrease the barrier to testing in our area. But to order to test, you really have to consider the diagnosis. And I think that's where we can do a better job. Initially, our PCR positivity rates were over 35%, which means we're probably not testing enough if our rates are that high. Right now, our PCR positivity is uh, of all the samples that are sent to our UW lab is 22%. So um, between a quarter and a fifth of people that are getting tested for monkeypox have monkeypox um, PCR positivity. So that's quite high. Um, still. What about treatment? So um, tecaviramat is uh, the recommended treatment for individuals who you feel like treatment is uh, warranted. This is an FDA approved medication. It's an antiviral that in inhibits um, P37 protein, which is in all orthopox viruses. So it, it was FDA approved for the use uh, in smallpox treatment based on animal data, which is right here in this slide, as well as safety data in over 400 healthy volunteers that suggested it's pretty well tolerated without any serious adverse effects. Be even though it's FDA approved, it's under a unique um, umbrella of FDA approved, but under a um, investigational new drug umbrella. So what that means is initially when we were prescribing it, it had to be, you had to be, an, uh, you had to enroll as a pr principal investigator to use this, to prescribe this and complete an informed consent 
as well as uh, initial intake paperwork to send to the CDC, as well as follow-up paperwork. We still have to do the informed consent and we still have to do the initial paperwork, but some of the barriers around um, prescribing TPOX have, have gone down at least to be able to more widely prescribe this medication. Here you can see some of the efficacy data in macaques. Um, this is around, this is for smallpox. Um, that's what the, the, the indication is in terms of FDA uh, use. Um, but the administration is, it's 600 milligrams. For most people, that's uh, 600 milligrams, unless you're over 120 kilos, that's three capsules every 12 hours for 14 days. And it requires a high fat intake of 25 grams and 600 calories for each dose. So that's quite high. We've been counseling people to have lots of nuts like peanut butter or avocado, which has a lot of fat, or actually just spoonfuls of um, olive oil. We've had some patients with food insecurity where it's a bit of a challenge in getting them big jars of peanut butter, um, as, which is stable um, at room temperature. And they can just take a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter with their doses to make sure that they get the fat intake they need to optimally absorb the medication. Um, in terms of the data prior to our use in this epidemic, there were really not that much human data. And there was this one paper that was published in the Lancet with one patient who got tecovirumab that showed that they did improve. Um, and you can see here in terms of duration of illness and in terms of PCR um, positivity and cycle threshold. Um, and so it is that the cycle threshold went higher, which means that the amount of virus was lower um, in this patient within days of taking uh, tecovirumab. out. We have some more real world data that was just published from one, from one of our former um, residents here, Angel Desai, who is at UCSD, um, has a letter in JAMA Open Network about 25 pa uh, patients that they treated at UCSD with uh, tecovirumab all were self-reported male, about 40 years old, nine of them had HIV, and the mean duration of symptoms at the time of initiation of treatment had been 12 days. Uh, about half of the patients had less than 10 lesions, but 100% of them had pain, which was their primary indication for treatment. And the majority also had fever, or those prodromal symptoms. And what their outcomes were uh, was, uh, was that um, 10 of their 25 patients had complete resolution of all of their symptoms, healing of their lesions within seven days of treatment. Of course, this is not a randomized controlled trial, um, but what they did find out is that patients tolerated it well and no one actually discontinued therapy. In our own system, we've actually treated um, close to 100 patients at this point or over 100 patients with tecovirumat, and they've um, for the most part, all of them have tolerated it quite well. There's only been one patient admitted for IV tecovirumab due to not being able to swallow initially, but was transitioned to oral medication quite quickly within days. We've had a few admissions for pain control and for more severe presentations, like I mentioned, like abscess um, or a septic arthritis presentation. But for the most part, all, uh, most of the patients have been treated in the outpatient setting with oral tecovirumab. What about other treatments? Um, Cydofovir is also uh, a medication that is effective against orthopox viruses in vitro and in animal studies, but there aren't, there aren't any human data. This is a medication that's already been approved for C treatment of CMV, and CDC does have a stockpile of cydofovir for use for expanded access in the treatment of orthopox viruses if there was a, um, an emergency. Bryn cydofovir is FD approved as of um, last year for the treatment of smallpox. There are not any efficacy data um, for monkeypox in humans, but it is effective against orthopox viruses in vitro and again in animal studies. There, the CDC is developing an EA, uh, which is an expanded access investigational new drug uh, protocol, um, but it is not available through the strategic national stockpile like tecovirumat or um, cytofavir. 
And lastly, um, vaccine immune globulin, um, that is not really being used at this point. Uh, it's licensed for the treatment of complications from the vaccine vaccine itself, which is a live vaccine, which I'll go into. Um, and, but there is a uh, expanded access protocol that would allow it to be used in the treatment of oxo ox orthopox viruses in the setting of an outbreak. Again, no efficacy data for monkeypox. So who to treat? Because not I mentioned that most people do really well. And so who actually needs treatment? I think, you know, we've had a fairly low threshold at UW Medicine to treat for patients that have been referred to our clinics, uh, mainly Harborview uh, Infectious Disease Clinic, Virology Clinic at Roosevelt, Northwest ID Clinic, uh, Aftercare Clinic is also doing TPOX treatment. And then lastly, Montlake Infectious Disease Clinic. Those are our sites that are currently doing it. And most of the providers that are prescribing TPOX or Tecaviramat have a fairly low threshold since many of the people do have pain are, and are concerned about um, progression of lesions. But in terms of who to treat based on CDC recommendations, anybody with severe disease um, should obviously uh, be offered treatment and anyone who's high risk for severe disease. So people that are immunocompromised, many of the patients in these case series that I've um, mentioned already have HIV. Um, and so that's one of the indications, anyone on immunosuppressive therapy, young people, anybody uh, pregnant, um, anyone with a skin disease or um, that may be a risk factor for more scarring or more progression of their um, monkeypox lesions, and anybody with complicated monkeypox that could be a secondary bacterial infection, um, severe nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, and any other concurrent disease or comorbidities. Um, so, um, and then other things to consider, particularly, uh, like I mentioned, since many of the patients are presenting with genital, uh, anogenital lesions, this is one of the things to consider treatment for, um, particularly because many of the patients have painful proctitis in that setting with those anogenital lesions. Other management, um, this is important to consider. One of the things that, um, that we should really be talking about is the pain management. And there was actually a letter that was um, a dear colleague letter to the CDC to um, discuss the importance of pain management in many of these individuals, particularly with the rectal symptoms and the proctitis. So stool softeners, lidocaine gel, um, you know, other anti-inflammatories that could be used. Um, avoiding opiates if possible, but we have had to give opiates for patients who have had just severe, even just for a few days until their tecaviramat kicks in and their lesions stop progressing so that they are not in severe pain. And then some other things in terms of magic mouthwash for oral lesions, um, frequent bathing changes their clothes frequently um, for these genital lesions. Other things when we talk about management for patients, the importance of isolation. I think this is a really big one to talk about. Pati unlike SARS-CoV-2 COVID infection, where we can say now that the CDC has even shortened it further to five days of isolation, and then you can go out and be with a mask for up to 10 days, there's not really a clear time point, point that they, we can say, okay, in a week or in two weeks, you're gonna be definitively out of isolation because it really depends on um, their lesions and what their lesions look like. And so what we want for to make sure that they're not shedding the virus is that they have those crusting of lesions, the crusting falls off and what's underneath is healed skin. And that, that can take weeks. That can take two to four weeks for some individuals. As I mentioned in that small case series from San Diego, people had, uh, once they started Tecaviramat, it was about a week, but some individuals may take longer. And particularly the anogenital lesions can take longer. Um, other things, counseling in terms of symptoms, monitoring for Tecaviramat because it is still under that investigational new drug, um, we are mandated to report any adverse effects, including hospitalizations, any other severe side effects that may develop um, from, from that. And then patients are also given a diary to keep track of their symptoms, but also of the progression or resolution of their lesions. There are two vaccines that are currently available, and I'll talk about one uh, first 
that we're not giving, which is the ACAM 2000, which is a live replication competent vaccine of virus. Um, it's administered by pricking the skin to cause a local infection. So for those of us who were old enough to get a smallpox vaccine, this is that vaccine where um, you basically cause that you um, inject the vaccine virus and cause a local site reaction and a, and the vaccine the virus has to take and cause a lesion a controlled lesion that is a pox lesion and heal and it's a one time vaccine there's not it's a one dose vaccine um but the problem is it's a live vaccine and you can you there's some wound care involved because you don't want to touch it and then spread it to other areas of your body there are some concerns about myocarditis pericarditis risk although quite low and then because it is a live vaccine it's contraindicated in many people um particularly pregnant and immunocompromised folks, as well as people with chronic skin conditions. Because if you have severe eczema or other conditions um, or can kind of inflammatory skin, what can happen is that you can have a more severe reaction from this live uh, vaccine, um, the, the ACAM 2000. And I just wanted to show some pictures of it. So you give it with a bifurcated needle and there you dip the bifurcated needle in the vial and you get this drop. And then what you do is you rapidly jab someone in the arm 15 times um, to introduce that live vaccine in. And what happens is that you want to see a take, meaning that you want to know that the, the vaccine is actually working by looking at the lesion. So if they don't develop a lesion, that's not that means it didn't take. And you can see here day five, day eight day 10 and day 14, similar to progression when you have actual live uh, infection with a pox virus. Obviously, not many people would sign up for this vaccine right now because it is scarring, it is a live vaccine, and we have an alternative. And the alternative is Genios, which is uh, a live non-replication competent virus um, that is that we are currently using. It is a two-dose vaccine series. Um, and to a dose 28 days apart, um, you're considered protected two weeks after your second dose. And there is some mostly local um, side effects, uh, pain at the injection site. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the other issues, particularly with intradermal. It's because it's a non-replicative virus, uh, it is okay to give in pregnancy and in immunocompromised persons. And this is the one that we've been using for, uh, uh, during this uh, outbreak. We were giving it sub-Q at a 0.5 um, milliliter dose, but then the FDA, because of the limited number of doses that we have uh, and, and not being able to really expand the criteria for who to get this vaccine, the FDA authorized the use of this vaccine intradermally. Uh, and that allows us to give a 0.1 milliliter dose, so a fifth of the dose intradermally, which means per vial we can get up to five doses. In the real world, it seems like many um, places are only get, able to get up to three to four doses. I know at our pop-up clinics that we've had in South County and in uh, Montlake more recently, we were able to get four doses consistently and even up to five doses. Um, but that allows us to give it to a lot more people. And just to what it's, it's similar to like a PPD placed in the forearm um, when we give it intradermally. And one other important thing to note is that it, with the intradermal method, there is a higher probability of a local site reaction and the potential for pigmentation. And you can see here um, that this is sort of the injection, people getting injection, and you can see the different skin colors uh, of the participants. And the uh, even six months out, you can see that there's still some hyperpigmentation at the site of um, the intradermal vaccine. Just yesterday in the New England Journal of Perspective, um, John Brooks from the CDC and Rochelle Walensky um, put in a piece just to really emphasize um, that 
shifting to intradermal doesn't mean that it's an inferior product. I think there's been a lot of concern that people aren't getting a full dose. And there's been a lot of other experience with intradermal vaccines and the efficacy around that, and really emphasizing that it does not, less vaccine intradermally does not mean it's a lesser option. Um, and really we want, we want to make sure that this, as many people as possible have the opportunity to get this vaccine um, to control this current epidemic. There are a couple of considerations in terms of people who should not potentially get the intradermal route, and that's precautions in people with keloids. So if you're someone who has a, um, or forms keloids at SCARS, this may be, um, uh, there's a relative contraindication. It's not really a contraindication, but a precaution. So many health jurisdictions and states have, have actually said, if you are screening, and so are we, to say, um, do you have a history of keloids and offering of the subcutaneous vaccine instead? We also, um, the EUA, the expanded, um, the emergency use authorization for the intradermal does not include individuals um, less than 18 years of old. So those individuals would get the subcutaneous vaccine. So who is getting the vaccine right now and who, what are the indications? So two specific indications, post-exposure prophylaxis. So in individuals at high risk um, who have had, a, an, or people who have had a high risk contact, intimate exposure, it's best to give within four days of exposure to prevent the development of monkeypox, but you can give it up to 14 days after exposure um, to prevent more severity of disease or disease itself. As I mentioned, the incubation period can be quite long, up to 21 days, so there may be still a benefit even giving it out to two weeks. And then pre-exposure prophylaxis. So we have um, opened it, initially vaccine supply was extremely limited and we were really focusing on post-exposure prophylaxis, but we've really opened it up more to pre-exposure prophylaxis, focusing on the highest risk. So last week, um, King County Public Health recommendations did change um, a little bit. So initially we were focusing on gay, bisexual, MSM, um, who ha um, have uh, had at least one of the following, if for pre-exposure prophylaxis, so multiple or anonymous sex partners in the last three months, history of syphilis gonorrhea, which is a surrogate for just higher risk, a methamphetamine use, attendance at bathhouses or public sex venues where you can have a lot of contact with people, close intimate contact. People who are experiencing homelessness, um, uh, this is under the category of gay, bisexual, MSM, um, if you've been incarcerated in the last three months, and then um, particularly our Black, Hispanic, um, uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, Pacific Islanders, and Indigenous people who um, we want to make sure have good access to the vaccine. Um, and lastly, sex workers of any sexual orientation and gender identity uh, are also able to get this vaccine at this time. So lastly, I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about addressing stigma, and I'm happy to open it up to questions. This is, you know, I think many people at the beginning, because this is really focused on um, initially on gay, bisexual, MSM, for the most part, like 95% of them um, in the case series, um, really getting away at stigma that this is a gay disease. I think people had some flashbacks to early in the AIDS epidemic about um, about this. And, and really there's been a, a, an effort and the CDC actually, this is from the CDC website about addressing stigma, really focusing on the fact that this is not a gay disease. Anyone can get monkeypox, but we also wanna make sure that the people at risk, which are currently gay, bisexual, MSM, are having access to prevention um, messaging and know about monkeypox, education about monkeypox. That means working with venues um, like bathhouses and putting up messaging and putting up messaging on websites and social media uh, to make people aware about monkeypox and um, the links to be able to get a vaccine. Avoid marginalizing groups of people and really making sure that they're, the messages are, are, are reaching people across racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic backgrounds. Uh, we have actually made a concerted effort uh, in our vaccine program to reach 
people that we know have not had the ability to get vaccines maybe in their community, so particularly South County, um, and then working with clinics that have um, higher numbers of um, gay bisexual MSM to make sure that they have ready access to vaccine. Um, and then really focusing on how it's spread rather than who it's who is getting it and using inclusive language like we are we are we are, um, you know, uh, concerned about monkeypox, not you should be concerned about monkeypox. We as a community are concerned about monkeypox. And this is what we can do to prevent um, the, the ongoing outbreak and epidemic. All right, so just some messages at the end, uh, pandemic of monkeypox continues to grow. We're continuing to see cases highly concentrated in gay and bisexual MSM, but we are also seeing it in other groups of people, uh, in cis women and in children now. Um, we don't know what does this mean for the future? Will this be an outbreak that then is contained or will we see it as an endemic STI? I'd like to thank Matt Chase, Matt Golden, Chase Cannon, and Maria Corcoran, who all uh, contributed this talk, and the UW Medicine uh, Monkeypox response team, uh, which includes many individuals, including Santiago, my co lead, and then Rupali and Jihan, who uh, Budak, Rupali Jane and Jihan Budak, who are and leads for our vaccine efforts. Jenny Brackett, who and Dana uh, Danica Little, who are our operational leads, pharmacy, uh, Steve Fialka, and June, who is our lead investigational drug service pharmacy, and many, many others, including Ungad Singh and Albert Lee, um, Chloe Bryson Khan for her Occam updates, and Nandita Mani for her employee health, and Tina Menkowski for her for com communication. So lots of people who are helping out with this response. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Danaretti. Um, I have, there's a lot of questions coming through as well as a lot of appreciation um, in the chat just for all this information. Um, one question just to start off with is sort of thinking about that relatively high rate of asymptomatic infection among at-risk people who are testing. Um, is there any thought that we should be thinking about just screening all patients who are coming in with risk factors with like an anal PCR or oral PCR based on their individual risk factors? That's a really good question. At this time, the recommendations are to not do asymptomatic screening. We may see some changes coming about, um, but right now, uh, there is not a recommendation to do that, like we do for extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia, because we know that there's a high percentage of individuals with that are asymptomatic for those infections, but we're not there yet in terms of those recommendations for monkeypox PCR. Got it. So maybe, maybe more to come in, in time. Yes. Uh, another, I think, I think there's got to be a study first to really look at that. Yeah. Um, Another maybe quick, but I think important question is, um, can you comment at all on the infection control precautions, um, particularly respiratory precautions for hospitalized patients with suspected or confirmed monkeypox? Sorry, Shreesha, did you hear me? No, because my... Um... Uh, volume because it went to my AirPods. That's okay. Um, so the question was about infection control precautions um, for folks admitted or with suspected or confirmed monkeypox. Um, what should we be doing? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Right now, um, there we are recommending uh, a respirator use, which we should be using anyway in clinical settings right now, and then a uh, gown and glove. And Chloe Bryson Kahn has been really leading the effort for the infection prevention and has updated it all on Occam. So um, that is a really good um, update. It's updated every week with any changes. And so if there is a concern for monkeypox or you're swabbing someone for monkeypox, please put them in isolation. Um, and then there is actually even a log that infection prevention is using so that they can go back and make sure um, that if there is, uh, you know, the patient, uh, is, there are issues uh, that they have a log of patients who have uh, employees who have been in the room. Awesome. I'm going to move now to some treatment questions. Um, so one question up front was just thinking about kind of the informed consent process for Takira 
Takariva Matt, excuse me. Uh, what are the risks that you go through with someone when you're doing that informed consent? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think it's really a, a, acknowledging that even though this is FDA approved, it was FDA approved based on animal data. And prior to this outbreak, we had very limited uh, uh, experience in humans. And so what uh, what the CDC really wants to know is how these patients do based on data and healthy volunteers. What I tell them is there wasn't any signal for severe side effects, some nausea, um, but really otherwise pretty well tolerated. Um, and I think it's also, I, I think people just need to know why we need to collect this information and send it to the CDC. That's really the, one of the main things and why we need to be able to do the intake form and send that to the CDC because normally we don't do that for medications, right? And so giving that history to the CDC as part of that informed consent. Got I think so I also use it as an opportunity to talk about the fat intake that's needed and um, and why that's important for absorption. But it sounds like it's more primarily about sort of data use informed consent as opposed to like side effects. Form, yeah, form and also consent. acknowledging that this is considered an investigational medication, um, and that's why we need to get this information. And Great. The um, sort of a follow up uh, is is a question about is there, do we know of existing efficacy RCTs um, both for treatment and for the vaccine? So that's a great question, and I um, Rachel Bender Ignacio uh, is. Uh, the lead for our AIDS clinical trial unit, which is named, uh, it's renamed uh, um, now to be more inclusive, but it's, they, the, those centers around the country are now being reutilized to help with emerging epidemics, pandemics, and they're actually going to be starting a randomized control trial with Tecavirumab, uh, treating people versus not treating people. Um, and so more to come about that, um, but we don't have that data yet. We have only um, sort of case reports at this point. Awesome. And then I have a note here from Dr. Chase Cannon, just wanting us to know that the sexual health clinic is will be doing a universal screening study, even in asymptomatic individuals, that will hopefully give us some more information. Um, a couple other vaccine questions that have come in. Um, one was about I'm wondering why is methamphetamine use singled out as an updated indicator? Yeah, that's a great question. So in a gay bisexual MSM, methamphetamine use is uh, is a risk for um, higher risk sex and increased sex partners and STIs. So we do know that in MSM who use meth, there's much higher rates of incident HIV infection. And so um, that's why that in and of itself is, is considered a risk. Um, great. And then another just vaccine question is wondering about what it, to what extent does the smallpox vaccine protect against monkeypox? And is that true even if someone is modestly immunosuppressed? Um, what do we think about the persistence of that immunity? We don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. Um, we we will find out, but we don't know at this point. And I think uh, the perspective from John Brooks is actually quite good. I would recommend that everyone read this about, you know, we just don't know. There's not a reason to think that it doesn't work, but we just don't have data. Great. And then I think um, one last question is just thinking about if we're treating someone with TPOX, um, is there a timeline for best efficacy? You know, I think often with COVID, we're thinking about getting antivirals in as quickly as possible. Um, and with that, are there certain pharmacies stocking it or is it more sort of widely available if someone sends, um, do they need to come to UW or to specific places to get it? Yeah, that's a great question. So Tecavirumab, because it's under investigational drug, new drug category, it cannot, it's not dispensed at any pharmacy. So Harborview Investigational Drug Service Pharmacy has been holding it for the region. Just in the past two weeks, we've been able to um, send it out to other sites so that other pharmacies can do it, but these are not commercial pharmacies. So we have it, um, we have it stored at Montlake now, at Northwest now, at Roosevelt, because those clinics are also prescribing. And then we are able to send it to other sites like Swedish um, and places where they are also prescribing. 
it, it's not something that you can write an epic. It's not a medication that you can just send to Walgreens. It's because it's it's investigational. There's some additional layers of um, bureaucracy and paperwork that need to be done. And so that's why our investigational drug services pharmacy has been doing a lot of heavy lifting. And it's one person, June, who has done a lot of work to, to um, make sure that patients get their treatment. And it is in terms of how, when to treat, um, uh, when in that uh, San Diego study, you can see that patients often had symptoms for even a couple of weeks before they got treated. Met, some patients have started, that first patient that I saw actually had symptoms for over 10 days, about two weeks actually, but initially had isolated lesions on the penis and then had disseminated lesions at the two week mark. So I don't think that, you know, even if they um, have had symptoms, ongoing symptoms for days or even more than a week, I think I would still treat. There was recently a patient who was seen in at UW Montlake who just didn't pick up his meds because he didn't get a chance to and picked him up, I think a week and a half later, but was still having ongoing lesions. Uh, I have to follow up with their PCP to see if he had clinical improvement. But in my anecdotal experience of our, our, our treating patients, and I'm curious to hear Chase and, and sexual health because they are doing a lot of treatment as well. People seem to do better and stop getting new lesions within just a couple of days of taking the medication. Awesome. Well, I think thanks for handling that wide array of questions. Um, I think a lot of folks were, have a lot of questions. This continues to evolve. Um, and so really are grateful for your presence here and ongoing support. Thanks everyone for joining us for our first Grand Rounds um, today. Uh, just as a reminder for this academic year, our Grand Rounds has moved to being every other week. And so our next um, speaker won't be for two Fridays from now, um, where we'll be joined by Scott Hagen. Um, I hope everyone has a great holiday weekend and we look forward to seeing you throughout the year this year.